Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Our Oscar series continues, and today we're talking about the nominees for cinematography. Returning to the show is David Tutman, also known as Tut. Tut, you're a New York-based cinematographer, currently working on Wu-Tang, an American saga, which is available on Hulu. Great to see you. Good to see you, Skid. How you doing? Not bad. Uh, this was a lot of fun last year. Let's dive right into it. We'll discuss the five nominees in alphabetical order by movie title. For listeners, this is your spoiler warning. First up, Judas and the Black Messiah, cinematography by Sean Bobbitt. What do you think of this one? I really like this movie. I found it overall entertaining and about a, a, a rather important story, uh, considering where we are as a nation right now. So I was uh, I was looking forward to it before it came out, and I found it entertaining and and I found it uh, particularly visually entertaining, I must say. I thought they used their wide aspect ratio really nicely. They definitely in- had a, a period inspired look uh, that, you know, you, th- you think about it was shot digitally like all of our nominees are this year. But uh, it, it really did have an authentic kind of inspired filmic look to me. Great high contrast, kind of a, an interesting green patina, which I, I always enjoy heavy color grading, uh, really powerful wide shots, not a ton of close-ups, but when they used them, they used them really well. Shot with Alexa large format LFs and mini LFs in 4K uh, with Ari DNA lenses. I think Sean Bobbitt really did a nice job um, with what he called heightened naturalism and uh, big lights, modern day lights, Astera tubes, he shot for the color grade, knowing that he'd do a lot in post-production, and it really seemed to work. Hey, Dan, one thing you mentioned, green patina. I don't think I know what that refers to. Well, just uh, the notion, there were, there were times where the color green just really played in the movie. And I, I, it's very true to period, aside from anything, and the, the burgeoning fluorescent lighting of the era. That green, to me, really plays, and it's always an interesting sheen. Uh, I try to favor it. Uh, my show's kind of period as well. And uh, I very much enjoy injecting that kind of green light into things. You know, the, the world is not monochromatic. And I think this movie really wants to explore that in certain ways. And you also talked about the sort of heightened realism. That's interesting because I also noticed something about this film where it felt like a conscious choice to sort of have things pop. Talk to me more about that or kind of what caught your eye. Well, again, you know, talking about that green patina or um, the, the overall color saturations, the graininess of the film, I think all of that contributes um, in a way, even though it's not real, to an authenticity in its storytelling. Uh, so the heightened colors, the, uh, the subdued colors for like J. Edgar Hoover and, and you know, their foes, um, it, it all in a way goes to further the storytelling and and in a way, set a certain type of vibrance and tension to our hero. Anything else about this film that uh, we should review? Well, I, I mean, I just thought it was a really strong piece of work. I thought uh, Shaka King, he did a really good job. Uh, great acting. I, I found uh, there was a lot of night work in the movie and uh, people fell in and out uh, in terms of their visibility. And I think that's a really great ploy in terms of, uh, bringing an audience in and developing tension. I I just think that overall, it was a really thoughtful, well-executed movie. Let's move on to the next film on our list. That would be Mank, cinematographer, Eric Messerschmidt. Well, uh, first of all, uh, there was an active decision on David Fincher's part to shoot the movie, uh, black and white. Um, they decided not to shoot film, which is a, definitely a David Fincher decision. Uh, he's a big fan of reds. And indeed, they did use a red camera. They, they, uh, David, what's a red camera? Red is a brand of camera. This, this one is an 8K camera, which is a, just a huge amount of information per frame. Basically, 8,000 pixels across, if I'm describing it correctly. And um, it's, it's pretty darn remarkable. <laughs> the level of definition one gets. I mean, honestly, I, as a cinematographer, I think it's, in television particularly, I think it's an overkill situation. Uh, we're getting into a realm where we're going to run out of storage space someday. I, well, I don't know. That's a joke. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, 
it, it's a it's a fascinating conundrum for cinematographers because of the amount of information um, you have to rely in a way on your post production uh, facility to really help you out because there's just there's too much information to handle at times. Um, so they basically uh, took a red camera that's stripped of its color filtration on the top of the chip that records that takes in the light information, and uh, it becomes a black and white camera which. Uh, records basically luminance. And with that, you then uh, will throw a lookup table on it to start giving yourselves a black and white look off of that luminance. Uh, so immediately, it, this is a movie that distinguishes itself technically from, from almost any other that's been nominated previously. The things that they were really concerned with, because of course, this is a movie about the making of an immortal movie, Citizen Kane. Uh, they wanted to make sure that they could emulate the grain and sense of depth, the contrast and the deep focuses. Um, deep focus is definitely something you can do in video more readily than you can with film. But uh, Eric Messerschmidt uh, did indeed shoot this film, this movie mostly at an 11. So he had a nice deep stop almost all the time. Most cinematographers when looking for a cinematic look in when shooting digitally, uh, don't wanna shoot much above a four or a two eight in order to keep the depth of field down and give it that more cinematic quality, take it out of video world. Um, but this is a this is a movie and a project which, of course, because of Citizen Kane, would embrace that deep depth. And uh, so it took a lot of uh, cooperation and collaboration with the art department because you really want to make sure that your objects and everything line up. And and because you're shooting in black and white, uh, certain finishes on wood will show up differently than expected. Uh, so that you're going to want to finish your furniture potentially differently than you might if you were shooting a color project. Um, all these things came into consideration and I, and I think are probably the most fascinating pieces of the movie in ways. So I think it's interesting because the story on this is that Fincher very much wanted to recreate the movie as if it was being filmed period as well. Right. What you're describing is a, they didn't go use the camera technology of the day. They're really using the cutting edge of our camera technology to recreate the feeling of using the technology of the day, or am I misinterpreting something there? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. The, um, the flashbacks they shot very classically in terms of where the lights went and, and gave it very, you know, kind of frontal punchy key lights. But when they went into the present day within the movie, when they weren't, you know, when they were in, in the days of the making of the film and in Manx's current sensibility, um, they shot it in a more modern manner with, with you know, your key light either to the side or slightly behind a person sometimes and, and a, a different type of philosophy on fill light and edging. And that was a very conscious decision on their part to differentiate. Uh, they used our modern abilities in a very theatrical way as well. Um, we're in a place where so many of our lights are now radio controlled and our dimmer boards can fit in a Halliburton case and get plugged in and broadcast instructions in terms of color and intensity and flicker. And, uh, and without a doubt, uh, this is a movie where they, uh, during transition, some of the transitions were actually done on camera, fade ins and fade outs and changes in intensity in various places in the lights. And, um, and that's a really neat game to play. You know, so it really celebrated modern technology while really trying to give it a, a very classic look, both lighting wise and editorially, it felt like. One of the most interesting scenes in the movie is uh, a walk through Hearst Garden, uh, which is uh, story wise done at night, but it was shot day for night. It was shot during the day. And um, it was done that way mostly because, again, these are all. Um, all of these movies cost under $40 million to make. You know, from 5 million to 38 million were the budgets listed in my research. And uh, Mank was a $25 million movie. So this walk through the garden, if it done at night, they couldn't afford to do it logistically and budget, budgetarily. So by doing it day for night, uh, they brought the costs down and made it logistically manageable. But the amount of fill light that was necessary in order to make it look balance properly for nighttime was so great that the actors were squinting all the time. So they had special contact lenses made for the actors 
oh, wow. uh, basically sunglass contact lenses so that they could walk through this field of 20 Ks just blasting at them uh, directly and, uh, and get through the scene uh, with open eyes. That's one of my favorite stories about the movie. <laughs> and I did not realize that this movie was made for 25 million. I would have almost guessed that was at the high end of the scale on this, but it sounds like they made a lot of decisions that actually, again, conserve the movie. I mean, you're using modern technology and approaches, but you're also trying to create what is a small or intimate film and shooting day for night would not be unheard of in that time period. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nifty, it's def- exactly. It was done a lot in those days and uh, a nifty idea, probably very tough to do. Uh, you know, I've, I've done a very little of it, but, but, uh, I happily was, uh, it was a scene in the woods and, and that's a, that's a really great place to go day for night. (laughs) Well, next on our list is news of the world cinematographer, Darius Wolski. This is actually the movie that I've seen most recently and is the highest budget of our nominees at $38 million, uh, which when you think about it in terms of what we know in terms of 200 million dollar movies and, and all that stuff. It's really uh, pretty tame. It's a, I thought, a strikingly beautiful movie. Beautiful, broad landscapes, while uh, really being a movie that's shot in terms of character in close up. I thought it was a beautiful balance of getting out there with, with the int- intimacy of our characters. The movies, uh, The Searcher and The Assassination of Jesse James were both inspirations. They both come through really beautifully in terms of intercultural tension and just uh, beauty of cinematography, aside from anything in vistas. And I I must say that I thought it was Tom Hanks' best performance in a really long time. I really thought he was uh, the least Tom Hanks in a way of any of the movies I've seen him in of late. I I very much enjoyed this movie. It was shot with a Ari Alexa large format and mini large format movies with Panavision Vintage 65s and uh, Anjanu zoom lenses. Um, I'm a big fan of the Anjanu zooms as a cinematographer. I really think they hold their own and they're lightweight um, other than the big 10 to one, but they enable a movie which was tremendously handheld and steady cam to go with a variety of focal lengths very quickly. I imagine that it was a very arduous and physical uh, job. There were mountainside shoots and in crevasses on hillsides and real real mountain climbing to get gear up and and knowing that you could rely on a couple of lenses to really cover your bases must have been a huge consideration and i think it worked very well darius wolski had with the art department uh took 100 kerosene fixtures uh and uh many of them uh, were electronically converted with LEDs into a 12 volt system that could again be radio controlled and flickered to create the mood that's so beautifully conveyed in all the interiors and exteriors at night. Uh, they feel tremendously practically driven. Uh, you really feel as if the lanterns and the fires are truly the lighting source. And I think for the most part, they are at the very least spiritually, and I'm sure there's some supplementation, but uh, it's really artfully done on the dark end while also being a movie that isn't afraid to shoot their actors in full sun, and beautifully so. I I thought technically it took the range of a a digital camera and really explored it as best one could. That was really well done. It's very interesting to talk about the range of scenes on this. You're right, that there's these full daylight, but there's also a lot of night and dark scenes as well. Um, A scene like where they have those crowds at night, that's gotta be an enormous undertaking. I think it's always tough to keep things visibly invisible is how I would put it, at least in terms of the background. That's always to me a very delicate art in in night lighting. It it shows how important it is to uh, have a a great collaboration with your production designer, with the art department, Uh, especially in this day and age of of video shooting. The cameras are so sensitive. Uh, You know, the, the Alexas are basically an 800 ASA camera but I'm shooting right now with a 2,500 ASA base camera if I care for it to be. And uh, the amount of sensitivity, the dynamic range is really something. In video, it's particularly important to protect your highlights. Whereas in film, I'd say you're really worried about protecting your downside. And, and these were all films that, um, that had a downside um, that was really nicely stretched and explored by the digital world, but it never lost control 
of the brightness. You know, there there were a couple of shots in News of the World where they're in their carriage uh, rolling and in the background is this backlit, hot, muddy, watery dirt. And it's very shiny. And I was really impressed by that shot because they just held the edge. It was barely in control, but it was beautifully in control with everything else we saw there. And that's not an easy thing to achieve. I thought that uh, there was a really, really fine balance achieved in this movie. Well, let's move on to our next film, which I'm guessing is at the other end of our budget scale, and that's Nomadland, cinematographer Joshua James Richards. Yeah, Nomadland. Um, really interesting. Uh, first of all, Joshua James Richard stepped into some controversy, I'd say, with Quentin Tarantino um, as this movie became more prominent because uh, Joshua James Richard said that uh, Quentin Tarantino's uh, snobbery towards film as opposed to digital production would mean that a movie like his would never get made. And uh, I understand where he's coming from in that I think a great movie can be made with any camera. You just have to celebrate its, its strengths and its limitations, understand them and use them as best you can to tell your story. And here's a story which was told with a beautiful movie camera, an Alexa Mini, which is nice and light, which is important because this was a completely handheld show, I would think, shot very intimately with very wide lenses, very close to subjects. And uh, how difficult that must have been when you're dealing with really a a bunch of amateur actors and a bunch of amateur performers for the most part with the, with, with Francis McDormand, of course, the, who led everyone on and brought out incredibly confident and, and composed performances with all these people who'd never been in front of a camera before, you know, and, you know, and thumbs up to Chloe Zhao, you know, who did an amazing job in const- constructing this. And it was, it was a movie that really, tried hard to celebrate life as it is, it seems to me. Very, very much available light. Joshua James Richard talks about how hard it was. His main job in a way was trying to be invisible with the camera, even though it was so up close and present. They would spend all day planning their shots, he, would, he said. And, uh, and they'd shoot during magic hour because it was the perfect time for this beautiful light without camera shadows. And, and it told a story of a very delicate balance and very intimate type of lighting. And he would say that uh, they'd spend all day planning and then there's chaos for like half an hour while they're just running around getting the scene. It was a crew of 19 men and 17 women traveling around in old vans. Wow. Did he do in his own camera work on this? Do you know? Yes, he, he operated. He operated the camera. They used lights, but very, very minimally. He never used one to light actors particularly. It was very, very much uh, au naturel, including the fact that he got bitten by a scorpion at a point and had to operate with a drastically painful arm for like three or four days while the poison left his system. Oh my uh, God. That was the big adventure on this job, but. It is an intimate movie. Uh, Joshua and Chloe Zhao are partners. Uh, he shot three movies for her. Um, they have a very, obviously a great shorthand. Um, and it's clearly a movie which um, speaks to democratization of many things, including filmmaking. So I, I give it a, a, a great salute and it must've been a very hard movie to make in its way. Is it indeed the lowest budget of these films? Is that the $5 oh, yeah. million? Dollar this one? One, oh, yeah. This one came in at $5 million. Really interesting. What scenes do you think are going to put on the reel for this? Wow. I, I saw it a while ago. But there's the woman who, who Frances' character spends the most of her time with. There's a scene where uh, she talks about her cancer diagnosis, which is just so amazingly honest and straightforward and accepting. And you'd never really think that there's a camera literally a foot from her nose. Right. And uh, the honesty and, and warmth and trust in that scene and, and trust in oneself and acceptance of fate, really interesting and compelling. So I, that one particularly, and all, all the beautiful dusk stuff, I keep thinking about the, the barely blue sky towards the end of scenes and the fight, you know, the scenes around the campfires and stuff. And, and, uh, there's ways in which it's cultish, but there seemed to be a 
desire for joy, which uh, if more people looked for it, we'd probably be in a better place overall. Well, very interesting film and, and, and certainly a, a standout in its approach um, and uh, use of the camera on this. Um, for a film to be competitive at this level, uh, yeah. it's, I think it's pretty amazing. The last film on our list is The Trial of the Chicago Seven, cinematographer Fadon Papa Michael. Well, Aaron Sorkin directing. Uh, this is in ways the most traditional of our movies, even though it's about complete non-traditionalists. It was shot, uh, again, Alexa, large format and mini large format cameras. They, uh, they did a bunch of the work this year. Uh, way to go, <laughs> Arflex. The, with Panavision C and T series lenses and Canon R and Canon K35 lenses as well. They went for anamorphic lenses to cover the full sensor. I think part of Fidon, uh, Papa Michael's philosophy was um, he wanted to make sure to deliver visual variety within the movie. Uh, things I've read about the movie and, and uh, accounts of the experience that people had on the movie is, is Aaron Sorkin is a very celebrated writer and he's very concentrated when directing on the writing and those who were speaking. But I think Fade on Papa Michael uh, wanted to make sure that within the, within the world of editorial that there were places to go to help build the emotion and the intensity and the relationships that are needed because it wasn't the Chicago One, of course, it's the Chicago Seven. And, and the tricks to filming groups while getting the intensity of a single individual and stuff I think this is a movie where that really fell on the cinematographer. And, uh, and it's an interesting uh, examination of a very big part of cinematography. We're often really consumed with cinematography with the look of a movie and think about light. But in ways for anyone in the camera department, I'd say the most important thing a cinematographer in ways has to think about is the cut. How is something going to cut? And I urge all my focus pullers, all my operators, to think about that as well when shooting, because um, you have to deliver something that's going to put the audience in the right place. And that is within the context of all these other images that have to come generally, unless you're making rope and then you have two shots and you don't worry so much about that. But uh, this was a tricky movie. It's a trial movie. So uh, there is some sitting and standing, but it's mostly people sitting and how to keep that interesting. Part of that, I think, was in the was in the lighting in a story like this, and uh, because there was so much time spent in the courtroom, and and he didn't want to be weather dependent and worried about uh, time delays on what again was um, a low budget movie for the type of movie it is. Lighting boxes were built for each of the windows in the courtroom, and uh, they were able to set a variety of different looks from a stormy day to a sunny day to a later day, early day, sun in different places. Uh, they, could, they could play games with the windows that were totally under their control in a timely manner by, by spending a little money up ahead. And I thought that was a really interesting thing because I think Fidon really, really knew that he had to create atmosphere and mood to buttress what I think is lacking in the movie, which is a certain type of variety and dynamicism of shots. Um, I, I can see where he fought that battle. I also understand that because of the budget, they could never fill the courtroom uh, or they could only do it on certain occasions. So they'd have, you know, instead of 200 extras, he was dealing with 40 or 50 extras. And so he would play games to make the courtroom feel more present at times that he couldn't afford to, or they'd have to jump back and forth and go back to a scene all of a sudden uh, to grab a shot with more people in it. So it was great that he had the lighting boxes because he could replicate the shot with very little problem on the day. Um, but those were the real tricks on, on this show, it felt. Um, you know, giving room for performances. There were some very broad and interesting performances in the movie. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's always fun to watch, uh, if you ask me. It was a movie that I thought worked really hard to provide a, a good period look, good distortion in the frame, graininess. Um, but I, I don't feel it necessarily captured the era as much as I would have liked in a story that I think held my imagination because I grew up, I was a little kid during that time. So I have very vivid memories of all these characters in my way. You talked about the challenges of the trial sets and building the light boxes. The scenes that aren't in the courtroom, anything particular about those strike you from a cinematic perspective? No, I mean, they, they, they felt very natural, um, certainly very well shot. 
you know, I, I think that that's a place where Fadon moved was definitely in charge of moving the camera and making sure that that things happened that tried to build dynamicism. You know, there was more room for that out there, but uh, it was, it was a movie that grabbed my attention in all honesty, less than the others. So, you know, I found it entertaining. A lot of that was performance. Um, But I, I was hoping for something that had a little more, um, I don't know, just a more of a raconteur, type of feeling, you know, a little more subversive. I thought that they could have gone farther in that direction, but that's more of a tonal thing than a cinematography thing. What is an interesting slate of films overall? I think tough to handicap, kind of depending on what the zeitgeist is of Academy voters this year. And it really will be a matter of, you know, what Academy voters take as their preference this year, I think. Truly, some really interesting looks. And, and it goes from things that are very highly processed and polished and, and really do tremendous work on the visual look like Mank uh, to a movie like Nomadland, you know, which, which really is as bare and unassuming visually in a certain way and as assuming visually in a certain way with its commitment to that as anything you can see. Really interesting. Is there anything this last year that caught your eye that's not on this list? Hmm. I don't know. I'd have to get back to you on that one. (laughs) I just, I've been, I've been working, I've been working, I've been shooting my own thing really more than anything the last couple of weeks. And I've been kind of buried in that. So I I was able to get to some details on all of these, which made me happy because it's always good to talk to you, but (laughs) I, I didn't put much thought into anything outside of these five for our for our little show all right uh, we'll put a pin in that thanks so much for coming on today this has been a lot of fun as always always good to see you take care of yourself this concludes our second week of oscar episodes with one more week to go i hope you've been following along but if not subscribing to the podcast is a great way to catch every episode i really appreciate your feedback you can send email comments to skid s-k-i-d at below the line one word dot biz that's b-i-z Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us reach new listeners. And new listeners, the best way to peruse previous episodes is at our website, belowtheline.biz. More than 70 episodes available. At some point, we might have featured a favorite show in the week. If you're on Facebook, you can find photos and other behind-the-scenes materials at Podcast Below the Line. And finally, you can follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram. It's at Pod Below the Line. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music and John Wan for our logo. The logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. Once again, thanks for listening. Be safe out there.